So it is my pleasure to do the dignitary thing of uh, introducing, uh, thank everybody for coming, first of all, um, and to introduce Hugh Geller, who is a PhD student here at Clemson, uh, and he's going to talk about DG structures on minimal free resolutions. Hugh. I forgot to add up fiber products. My bad. Um, thank you for inviting me to speak and thank you to everyone for showing up. Um, I'm always excited to speak on this topic. Um, I've been grinding away at it for a little while. Um, so I'm just gonna set up some notation and then I'll talk about you know, why am I even considering this? So to start, um, I'm just gonna take K to be a field. Um, and before anyone can ask, I, I don't put any restrictions on the characteristic, just choose your favorite field. Um, X is just going to be some list of X variables. Y is going to be a list of Y variables, not necessarily the same number as the X variables. Um, I'm going to take I to be an ideal contained in the maximal ideal generated by x's in the x polynomial ring j is contained in the maximal ideal generated by y's in the y polynomial ring so again ideals and so that the object that i'm interested in is the fiber product of k adjoined x mod i fiber over k with k adjoined y's over j. Um, and the way I'm going to be thinking about the fiber product throughout the talk is using this isomorphism, where it's going to be isomorphic to k adjoined x's and y's over the ideal generated by i. Um, the set of x, i, y, j's, um, and j. So I guess I should add that notation up here. Just as a little aside, the x underscore, y underscore, when they appear together, it's just x, i, y, j for all the i's and j's that can occur. Um, so the, the reason I'm interested in fiber products goes, or comes from a result by Nase and Sater Wagstaff. So, theorem. Um, in 2017. And so, in this theorem, they let M and N be finitely generated modules over the fiber product, which we're going to call R, but it's just some quotient ring S, uh, fiber over K, T, or really just any rings. When I think about it, it's quotient rings of polynomial rings. Um, and they get two results here. First is if the depth of either one of those rings is zero, Um, not comma, and uh, you have one of the tors of M and N equal to zero for I greater than or equal to five, then M or N is free over R. And then part B, which is a little bit more where I'm looking at in general, helps if I spell words correctly. If you get two consecutive vanishing tors, um, still with i greater than or equal to five, then either uh, m or n has finite projective dimension. And actually, it's a lot stronger than that. Um, it has at most projective dimension one. And so 
what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to reproof this result. You might be asking, well, we already have the result. Why are we trying to reprove it? Well, the reason I'm trying to reprove it is because I want to use DG methods um, to, to obtain this result. Uh, when Nisei and Sater or Wagstaff um, obtained this result, they used uh, minimal free resolutions for uh, modules over the fiber product itself uh, to, to build this result. Uh, and those came from Frank Moore's dissertation. Um, but then there are all these other classes of rings where we get this nice Tor-friendly property, so part B, um, using DG methods. And so naturally the question is, well, do DG methods apply here? And so I guess the first thing I need to do is I need to give the definition of a DG algebra because that's what I'm trying to work with. Um, if you were here two weeks ago, you heard Keller give the definition. If you weren't, I'll just give it again. Um, the only difference is I only consider something to be a DG algebra if it's associative, whereas Keller is a little bit more flexible, you know, lenient and says, you know, I'm working with a DG algebra or an associated DG algebra. So when I say DG algebra, Really, I mean associative DG algebra. Uh, uh, you, before, okay, before you go forward, um, I guess I just want to ask, maybe you're, you're going to answer this later, but um, I, I'm just wondering if you could say a word about five. I guess I'm just curious about why five. Um, to be honest, I don't remember at the moment, um, which is a little embarrassing to admit right now, but um, maybe right, Sean will be kind enough afterwards to... Uh, yeah we, can talk about it. yeah, we can talk about it after the talk. Thank you. Yeah, because that, that is an interesting bound. So, so. I'll, can I say thir five seconds about that? Go for it. So step one, you have to take syzygies, right? And so you have to have enough. Uh, and, and actually, you need to take two second syzygies because there's a structure theorem for second syzygies over a fiber product. And so that gets you up to, to, to the spot. Um, but Roger and Sylvia and Thiago and Liana, or sorry, are some folks in the in the, the club in the, the meeting might actually be part of a project where they improve those bounds a little bit. So wouldn't that um, give you four instead of five? What you said there was a right, and so so that gets you up to the spot where you're assuming it for i greater then are equal to one, right? And that's that's what we needed is 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 really tor one uh, for the for the things that have that structure for the second syzygies because your second syzygy will decompose really nicely into an uh, I forget s module and a t module, uh, and then you can turn Frank's Frank's machine lets you do the thing. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. So um, I'm just going to quickly give the definition of a DG algebra. So definition, a, so differential graded algebra. I guess I'll spell all that out. Differential graded algebra is a complex A over your ring R with a binary prop, uh, binary operation um, satisfying following properties. So it needs to be associative, distributive, you need to have an identity so unital, graded commutative. And uh, when I first was learning about DG algebras, this was the weirdest one for me. Um, so just in case uh, anyone here has not seen that before, A times B is going to be negative 1 times the homological degree, or negative 1 to uh, the homological degree of A times the homological degree of B, B times A. And then it has to satisfy the Leibniz rule, which is um, if you take your differential in degree A plus B, you apply it to A times B, 
get a sort of product rule looking formula. Degree of B, which is really nice. Um, so it's a nice little definition. Uh, the first time you ever really run into this is when you talk about the exterior algebra, in particular when you're talking about you know, the Kazool complex as an exterior algebra. And throughout the talk, there are gonna be two Kazool complexes that I'm gonna use a lot over and over. So I'm just gonna write them out really quickly. Uh, the first one I'm gonna call X, and this is gonna be the Kazool complex on x1, x2 over the polynomial ring adjoined x1, x2. And so this is just 0, kx minus x2, x1, x1, x2. And someday I'll learn how to space everything nicely to not go right up against the edge like that. Um, and then the other one I'm going to do is y, so, um, so this is gonna be uh, y1, y2, y3. I'm gonna get lazy and use the, the underscore there. Um, just give myself a little bit more room. Zero goes to k adjoined all the y's. Uh, y3 minus y2, y1. So th the reason I'm writing out all these differentials is I'm going to point at something later and be like, hey, the differentials are back. So minus y2, y1, 0. Ba, ba, ba. I have this bad habit of singing to myself as I write. Um, it always amuses the students. By the way, if, if you probably have a lasso tool, if you want to pull things to the left, you need more space. Mm -hmm. That's a good call, so I can fit that last, z or the last little bit in. So, okay, I joined the ones, and then to zero. And so multiplication in these cases um, you know, looks something like this. So I'm going to take F12, which is going to be in uh, Y degree 2. And I'll take F3 um, in Y degree 1. And if I want to look at F12 times F3, in this case, it's going to be F123, which is nice. Um, so you can also do this with the Taylor resolution where you might have coefficients popping out, but the Kazool complex is really nice when it comes to, to the multiplication. So the reason these are coming... For your example, it might be helpful for you to say what these basis vectors are corresponding to. Um, so... Unless you did that above and I missed it. So if you want to think about it in terms of like an exterior algebra, F12, you can think of as F1 wedge F2, and you can think of F3 just as F3. So when you talk about F1, let me go over here. You've got F12 times F3. Really what you're thinking of is F1 wedge F2 wedge F3. Uh, so the reason these examples come up is because I'm going to use them to address my first case of fiber products. So the first case is going to be edge ideals of complete bipartite graphs. And so my go-to example is always K23. We're going to pretend that those dots are actually 
hitting the right places. So x1, x2, y1, y2, y3. And so the edge ideal is the ideal generated by um, the xi, yj's, where xi and yj um, have an, an edge between them. And so it's just going to end up being um, the ideal generated by xi, yj, where i equals 1 or 2, and j um, is equal to 1, 2, or 3. I guess I should say is an element of. And the reason I like these ideals, leave the, that up at the top of the screen, is because if I take k adjoin my x's and y's and I mod out by the edge ideal of k to 3, really what I'm looking at is This ideal, the x, i, y, j, is going back to my original notation. And in this case, we think back to the, the fiber product isomorphism I'm going to use. And my i ideal and my j ideal are both the zero ideals. So really, this is k adjoined x's fiber over k with k adjoined y's. So goal number one was get a minimal free resolution uh, for um, these fiber products. And the great news about this is this was done back in 2006. So Daniel Vischer in 06 gives an explicit minimal resolution of these ideals. Over k join the x's and y's, um, and so a lot of what I was doing at first was just saying, you know, can I put a, a DG structure on these minimal free resolutions? And there's a paper on the the archive that never got published beyond that um, by Emil Skoldberg that says, you know, using discrete Morse theory, you can put a DG structure. Um, on these resolutions. Now, it looked like there might be some issue with, you know, some of the, the operators he was using um, being um, linear over the right, lit, right uh, ring. And so uh, what I decided was instead of, you know, taking that paper's word for it, I was going to go through and come up with these structures myself. And the best way to do that was to start with some examples. And so this is where K23 came in. So I'm going to jump screens because I have the, all of the minimal resolution for K23 already written out. I'm also going to switch to scrolling horizontally so we can kind of go along the resolution. So um, one annoying thing is we have this huge gap that I just can't figure out how to get rid of other than to like zoom in a little bit and hope. So. Um, it's, the length is four and these matrices are getting pretty big, but what you're noticing everywhere is you've just got, uh, X's, Y's and zeros, um, and minus signs where they need to be. And one thing about this example that eventually helped me figure out what the DG structure is, is this differential that we're looking at right now. And what stood out about it is here. I'm seeing one of the differentials from the Kazool complex on the Y variable. So I'm seeing that second differential. And then I'm seeing it here as well. And then I started going, all right, you know, these differentials, they have to play in somehow. And then I started, you know, maybe nitpicking, elaborating a little bit, but I said, well, if I ignore the zeros, then I sort of have the, the differential for the X variables here and here. And I said, well, what about in higher degrees? Well, you're getting that Y differential again. You're getting another Y differential and another in the X's. And so I'm seeing all these Kazool pieces popping up. And so the question became, well, why are they there? And can I use this? Because I know the Kazool uh, complex is already a DG algebra. 
So going back to the other screen, what I found was if I want to resolve uh, K adjoined X's and Y's for the complete bipartite graph on uh, K, M, N, M, N, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the Kazool complex on M, X variables and the Kazool complex on Y or N, Y variables. I'm going to sort of mash them together in a clever way. So, uh oh, my screen. One sec. Oh, I have to switch the scrolling back to vertical. Someday I will master technology. Hopefully before. I, I get tenure somewhere. So what I did was I said, all right, that very first differential is made up of X, I, Y, J's. So really what I want is I want to have the uh, ideal generated by X's. I want to have it tensor over K with the ideal generated by Y's because that's going to give me, you know, X, I tensor Y, J, which is effectively what I'm looking for. And so to do this, I took my Kazool complex on the X variables, which I'm always just going to call X. And I said, all right, let's throw away the degree zero bit. I'm no longer going to have um, a resolution, but I'm going to have something that's exact everywhere except in degree one. And in degree one, the homology is going to be exactly the ideal generated by the X's. And then I said, okay, you know, let's tensor that with the same thing on the Kazool complex for Y variables. And now because I'm tensoring over K, everything's nice and flat. And so the only homology I have to worry about in this case is in degree two, but in degree two, I'm getting exactly that tensor product. But I need to go one step further. I need to get that into the bottom of a quotient ring. So I sort of break some rules and it turns out to behave nicely anyways. But I, I take this, statement and I, I move it over a little bit and say all right well this is going to be part of my construction it's going to be the part whenever i is greater than or equal to one and i have to give a new name to what's going on so i'm going to call this x star y and i use star because i couldn't come up with a creative name or symbol so now i've got a complex that has the ideal, this ideal up here as the homology in degree one, but really I wanna move it into the bottom of a quotient ring. So I'm just gonna take X not tensor over K with Y not if I is equal to zero. And you have to do some running around to make sure everything works out nicely. But as long as you define your differential in a corresponding way, so, using the truncated different or the differential for the tensor of the truncated sequences or complexes for i greater than or equal to two and then just the degree one partials for i equal to one and then zero everywhere else you get the following theorem you get x star y resolves um, K join X's and Y's minimally over K join X and Y. And so again, this is just recovering the results of uh, Bisher in 06. If you compare my resolution to his, uh, there are some sign changes in there, but that's just because I wanted to um, have my differentials look a certain way. I wanted minus signs to appear in a certain order. Um, before I get into the DG structure, you recover a nice little corollary about the Poincaré series. Um, and so in this case, we have K adjoined X's and Y's over T, well, this is just going to be 
one plus the Poincaré series for k over k adjoined, oh, we need a one over t out front, over um, k adjoined x variables of t minus one, and then the Poincaré series for k again, but k adjoined y over t minus one, but we know exactly what these are because uh, we can use the Kazool complexes to get those Poincaré series. So we have one plus one over T. And the reason I like this is because um, from here, I'm able to extract my Betty numbers um, because this is something that's just uh, simple to, to expand out, assuming M and N are small enough. Um, it grows big, or it gets big pretty quickly, but I, I like this part about it. So, Poincaré series are nice, the minimal free resolution is nice, but really what I wanted to get was I wanted to get that DG structure. And so, as I sort through my notes to find where it's at, explicit examples written down. So if I took an element like E1 star F2, so again you can think of these as you know exterior variables um, and eventually I'm gonna have something like E12 so if you want, you can think of that as E1 wedge E2. I take that and I multiply that by E1, and I wish I, oh, I have it right here. Oh, no. I'm sad I wrote them down and then misplaced them. Anyways, E1 star, F3, then I have this formula that says this is going to be E1 times E1 star Y2 F3 and then minus E1, the differential on E1 star F2 F3. And so we end up with that going to zero because we've got an odd element times itself. And then we have minus x1 e1 star f2 f3. And so the way that I went about going and you know finding these formulas or formulas like this one is I would apply Leibniz rule to it. I'd say, all right, if Leibniz rule is going to work, what are the possibilities for this product? So I went through and chased through all these different things, and eventually I got to the following theorem. It's kind of gross looking, but it's how I'm able to just sit here and go, oh, this is what these two products are. Um, if you don't care about DG stuff, I apologize. If you don't want to see this formula, I'm, I'm really proud of it because it is a mess to prove and to figure out, and so it's my little like own gold star. Um, so if X is a DG algebra and Y is Kazool or Taylor, and that's a restriction that I'm working on lifting, but for now it's fine because, you know, we're thinking of Y as the Kazool complex on the Y variables then x star y has a DG algebra structure. Given by E um, I, so this is bad notation because this I is just going to be a set of numbers one through M. Um, star F omega 
EJ star F gamma. And if I wanted to write this as, you know, a bunch of different cases, I'd have six different cases, but you're going to see a bunch of indicator functions that allows me to write it out as one single, not necessarily simple, but one single formula. So the indicator function that says omega one is less than or equal to gamma one is less than omega two. So omega one and omega two are elements of capital omega. Gamma one is an element of capital gamma. I'll write that all out at the end. So if this statement is true, we get back a one. If it's false, we get back a zero. Minus one to the degree of f omega minus one times the degree of ej minus one. Ei, ej, star, and then I have this p function, p for a specific projection. Um, it's kind of difficult to explain, you know, in a presentation. I'm working on, you know, making, finding a clearer way to express it. But I'm going to have some projection function that sends f omega to something that occurs in uh, the differential applied to f omega times f gamma. And so all the products that we're seeing there are products within the Kazool complex or within the, the respective DG algebras. We then subtract off, oh, subtract off the indicator function that says omega one is less than or equal to gamma one. Another indicator function uh, that's taking into consideration what is the homological degree of E sub J. And so we want it to be one for this next part to exist. And so it'll be EI times the partial applied to EJ star F omega F gamma. Then we add in the case that gamma one is less than omega one is less than gamma two. EJ, and then we'll have EI, EJ, star F omega, and then that same projection function applied to F gamma. And so this line really comes in to uh, get the, the correct kind of symmetry or mirroring to the, the first line. And similarly, I'm going to add a fourth line that sort of mirrors what's happening in the, the second line. So we subtract off gamma one less than omega one. This indicator function, then we have uh, minus one to, to this degree. And the differential applied to EI times EJ star F omega F gamma. Um, and so the way you want to think about some of these things is omega is just going to be some finite list W1, or not W, omega 1, omega 2, up to just some omega L. Gamma is defined similarly. And it might seem weird or unnecessary to have all these indicator functions in there. Um, but the presence of these indicator functions allowed me to take the proof of this, this product being associative and take, um, take what would be 720 cases and treat it all as one. Um, and so, you know, you, you have to establish, you know, how do you do algebra with these indicator functions? When are they zero divisors against each other? And there's a lot of logic behind there that, you know, you have to work through to make sure, you know, every single step of, of your proof is logically sound and you're just not like accidentally overlooking something. And so this is like my little child that I'm super, super proud of. However, it doesn't go far enough. And the reason it doesn't go far enough is it's only putting a DG structure on the minimal resolution of these quotient rings or of those fiber products. And I want to get it on all fiber products. And so for a while, I was banging my head against the desk, like, how do I even get the minimal 
free resolution for just any fiber product. So this is where I had to, you know, start to get extra creative. Now I'm gonna try and resolve K adjoined X1, X2, modded out by X1 squared, X1, X2. I'm gonna fiber that over K. And I don't feel like crying in front of you all, so we're just gonna keep it K adjoined Y1, Y2, Y3. Uh, originally, I had another ideal uh, for the, the y variables. And when I computed what the Betty numbers were going to be, one of them was 31 followed by 30. And I didn't want to write that matrix out on the spot or beforehand. So we decided to go with a simpler case. So this, oh, let's get the marker back, is isomorphic to, okay, I join the x's, the y's, we're gonna go back to calling that, that bottom ideal I. And so my very first thought, and if, if you attended my, my talk at the AMS this past weekend, uh, I shared what this thought was. My very first thought was, oh, well, you know, I just wanna map I into K adjoined X's and Y's over X's and Y's. So I wanted this to be true, but I was getting a little ahead of myself. And luckily I have Sean to, you know, pull me back when, when I get overexcited and help me do that little reality check. So the reality check was, I don't know if I, you know, the way I'm originally thinking about it can embed into that quotient ring. However, not only can I get it to embed into the quotient ring if I change the ideal a little bit, but I know that I'm gonna make this a short exact sequence if I just you know, add the quotient ring next to it. So it's image within the quotient. So this is what I want to resolve. This is resolved by x star y. And so I figure, you know, if I can resolve this somehow, then maybe, maybe I can get my hands on a resolution for the fiber product. So the first thing I know is that since i is contained in the maximal ideal generated by x's, I'm able to rewrite the ideal within the quotient ring as I tensor over K with K adjoined Y's wadded out by that ideal. And the reason I like this is because I've already resolved this first part, or I guess technically second part using Y. And so I go back to, you know, thinking about that Kazool complex on you know, Y1, Y2, Y3, and I'm good to go there. But then I say, all right, well, you know, how do I get my hands on I? Well, I'm gonna assume cursive I resolves this quotient ring. And we're gonna assume that because why would I fiber that, that quotient ring and, and think that I didn't need to have information about that quotient ring to begin with. So now I go through the same process that I did with those Kazool complexes where I say, well, I, I need my hands to get on I, not, not the quotient ring. So I go, oh, hey, I, drop your degree zero part. So now I have homology in degree one and only in degree one giving me the ideal I. I'm gonna tensor it over K with the Kazool complex and the Y variables. And then I'm gonna shift it. 
And so it takes a little bit of work, but not, not too much to say this resolves I tensor over K. So now I want to try and move into the world of mapping cones. And the reason I want to do that is because mapping cones are going to give me those nice long exact sequences on homology. And so I want to get some map from here into, or not into, but to x star y. And so where this starts is it starts by saying, well, I, in the case where it's x1 squared um, and x1, x2, this is equal to zero goes to k adjoint x's minus x2, x1. x1 squared, x1, x2, that goes to zero. And I know that I can map it into, or map it to x, so the Kazool complex on just x1, x2. And not only can I do that, but when I do, I can do it so that in degree zero, I just have the identity map, which is great because, um, well, because it's helpful. And then in higher degrees, uh, I build a chain map. And you know, we all know that these chain maps aren't unique. So for longer sequences, I'm going to want to choose them in a very clever way. But this one's short enough that I'm able to get away with doing this. So I say, all right, this is called phi. So I have little phi. I'm going to use little phi to build a big phi up here, which is the map that I want. So first thing I need to do is I need to see what this resolution looks like, the, the shifted one, which I already wrote out because it's large and messy. Scroll direction, horizontal. So um, towards the, the larger degrees in homology, you're getting um, differentials that look exactly like the differentials that we had for K23, um, other than this minus sign, which is one of the reasons that I left the minus sign out front. The other reason is because I'm going to get rid of that minus sign when I take a mapping cone. So I scroll over to the next line, it still looks the same, um, though there's a little extra bit where I'm now landing um, in seven copies of the polynomial ring instead of six. And then move over once more. So I say, okay, you know, this is my resolution. How am I gonna build the right map? Well, it turns out to, to not be awful to do. It, you sort of have to sit there and work through it. But the formula, which I have up here, well, I have written down, yes. The formula to build phi is the following. So you take negative one, the alpha plus beta, phi of alpha, star beta, and beta greater than zero, phi one, i alpha, star beta. If the degree of beta is equal to zero, but the degree of alpha is equal to one, and then zero otherwise. Now in this example, it turns out to be pretty nice. I'm going to jump to another screen and switch the scrolling again. So in degree zero, um, it just ends up being, oh, let's put the laser pointer on, ends up being the differential from cursive i in, in degree one. 
And then in degree one, it's almost the identity matrix times x1, but we've got this, this column of zeros. And that's coming from having an element in here, alpha one, two, tensor one. So we need to kill that one off. So that's why we have that column of zeros. And then in higher degrees, it seems to stabilize in the sense that I'm just able to take x1 or minus x1 times a uh, identity matrix of, of the appropriate size. And so just part of phi can be seen here, so in higher degrees. And so now when I look at this, I'm going to point at the pieces that build the differential in the cone. So I see, you know, these all have x's and y's. This has all x's, and this has all x's and y's. And you'll see that throughout. And so you end up with the cone of phi being a minimal resolution. So theorem, the phi going from the shift to the star is a chain map. And cone phi resolves the ring that we want it to. And so in our case, um, I being x1, x, or x1 squared and x1, x2. The ideal generated by those terms. Um, you can do something similar to um, get the j, ver or j ideal in there if the i ideal is zero. And then in my talk on Saturday, I explained how to take those two different mapping cones and sort of smash them together in a clever way such that um, you get a minimal free resolution of um, the full fiber product that I'm looking at. Um, however, where I'm at in my research is saying, I've got these minimal resolutions, can I put a DG structure on them? So with the last two minutes, I'm gonna write out the, the theorem that's in the paper that I'm writing right now, but I'm also hoping to improve upon. So, theorem. Cone phi as above is a DG module over X star Y. And so the, the nice thing about cone phi is some of the elements in it are coming from X star Y. So I don't have to worry about um, what or that the action of x star y on, on that part is, because it's just going to be the multiplication that we know. Where you really need, get concerned is when you have um, something coming from the tensor product of your i cursive i complex. And so what this looks like is e i star f omega acts on alpha tensor f gamma by getting the negative indicator function that EI is in degree one times minus one, the alpha minus one uh, F omega, you apply the partial to EI alpha tensor F omega F gamma. And this makes sense because you're only taking the differential of EI if it's in degree one. So you're going to get back a scalar. And then the other multiplication is just happening in the Kazool complex. And then over here, you have omega one is less than or equal to gamma one minus one to the alpha times the degree of F omega minus one plus the degree of F gamma EI little phi of alpha star f omega f gamma. I have that in the case where you know the j ideal is zero and the i ideal is whatever you want it to be. 
Now I'm trying to get the other way around and then hopefully I'll be able to bring those together to get uh, the minimal uh, free resolution of any fiber product uh, can be considered a DG ideal over X star Y. Um, but I think this is probably a good ending point. So we'll stop here. Thank you. Thanks, Hugh. Let's go ahead and uh, thank you with our reactions. Any questions for you? Francesca. I had more like kind of a comment, which can be which could be completely silly because I was just looking at these um, these matrices, and these matrices really look like some kind of chronicler products of other matrices. So I wonder whether you can write your differentials compactly as some kind of chronicler product or combination of zero identity matrix and del x and del y. But I don't know, I was just kind of eyeballing it. And I don't know if you already said it implicitly. So what I can do, and I didn't put it in here uh, just because I wasn't looking, or because I wasn't sharing the case where the J ideal was non-zero. But if, if F is your fiber product, or let's say is the resolution of then the partial of F in degree I is the partial in degree I of X star Y, V I minus one. Um, and then I similarly build a psi I minus one, zero. Um, the truncation of I tensored with K in degree I, zero, zero, zero. Uh, and so J is defined analogously to, uh, or cursive J is defined analogously to cursive I. And so it's, it's a bit more compact. As for the X star Y um, differentials, I'm gonna have to work on finding a nice compact way to write those down. Um, but I guess I'm at the point where gotten so used to just looking at them and you know you trace through everything. So I might need to take a step back and say, all right, if, if I haven't worked with these so much, you know, how would I want to view them? Yeah, I, I guess that's what I was looking at myself, like looking, eyeballing it, or like, oh, this, it, you know, just block matrices to me looks like a chrono product of matrices. Yeah. I don't know. This I think is, it's something yeah. uh, It looks like there are more questions in the, the chat. Um, so there's a question about, you know, thinking about these geometrically, um, the Durham complex or s of smooth varieties. So admittedly, I don't know much geometry, algebraic geometry. And so I, I don't really know the best way to, to think about these in those terms. Um, These are some good questions. Thank you, Patrick. I, I have no idea if the fiber product commutes with the, the DG spec, but um, I'd definitely be interested in looking at that. Um, there's another question in there about progress concerning the vanishing of Tor. Um, so, you know, that, that's the end goal of what I'm, I'm working towards. Um, if I can get these DG modules to be DG algebras plus, you know, another constraint, then uh, there's a recent, recently published result, though I guess the result has been known for a while that, you know, from Avramov, Iyengar, Seder Wagstaff, Nisei, I'm going to be embarrassed if I'm missing a name right now. Um, but essentially you, if you have your DG algebra plus these other conditions, you, you get this nice Tor vanishing property for free. And so the questions that I have to tackle right now are, can I make my DG module into a DG algebra? If so, great. Does it also satisfy the other property? If not, can I take 
you know, that, that machinery that would give me the result for free and can I modify it so that it, it allows for me to just plug in a DG module instead. Um, and so I'm sort of in the process of figuring out which one of those two approaches is going to be more fruitful. Any other questions for Hugh? I will say that the, the regular prime spectrum for the fiber product is easy to describe, right? It's just the, the two prime spectra considered separately with the, the maximal ideals identified together, at least in the, in the local case, which is really what I'm thinking of. And I haven't thought about what happens with the, I and mean, we're not really, Hugh's not really doing a DG fiber product. Um, so anyway. All right. Let's thank you again. Very nice, Hugh. Thank you so much.